Hey everyone, welcome back to our hardware news recap for the last week. We're looking at the week of July 3rd for this one, including some last minute news that made it in on Ryzen Threadripper and the R3 CPUs. Now that those are finally officially announced with specifications and prices. So we've got that and more, a lot of news from the NAND side of the industry, NAND and DRAM shortages and process changes. Uh, and then a couple of other small items to get through because we're taking a break from Vega for one day here. Before getting to those, this coverage is brought to you by EVGA and their 1080 Ti SC2, which we've recommended fairly highly for its build quality and uh, the ICX sensors, which are kind of fun to play with. You can check our full SC2 review for the 1080 Ti if you're curious to learn more, or you can click the link in the description below to find the product page for the 1080 Ti SC2. Starting with Threadripper and the new Ryzen CPUs. So first of all, the finalized official name is Ryzen Threadripper, not just Threadripper. So it is Ryzen Threadripper, and that means that the Threadripper CPUs will bear some of the same branding, uh, like R9, for instance. But the main chips that were announced today were the 1920X and then the 1950X, and those respectively are $800 and $1,000. The 1920X Threadripper CPU is a 12-core, 24-thread CPU, and then the 1950X at $1,000 is a 16-core, 32-thread CPU. The 1950X has a base clock of 3.4 gigahertz. It will boost up to 4.0, and then the 1920X is 3.5 and boosts to 4.0 as well. So these are a bit slower than the high-end R7s that exist in terms of the base clock, but overall, uh, they, it's completely familiar architecture, it's familiar clocks for the most part, which is actually uh, a bit higher than what some of the earlier rumors suggested, so that's good to see. And then these CPUs also support quad-channel DDR4, that's kind of new official information. The uh, PCIe lane count has already been known for a while, it's 60, with 4 going to the chipset, so you might hear 64 when talking about the lane count on these CPUs. And then finally, the big thing here is it's likely still August 10th for the release date. That's what we heard from a board partner back during Computex. Uh, and AMD basically confirmed early August. So that seems to align with that. And then this one was less sensational, but still import important. The re-announcement of the Ryzen 3, the R3 CPUs. Uh, they're looking at four core, four thread processors available July 27th. So that's new as well. Uh, new information and those should be analogous to Intel's i5s and i3s uh, but we'll see we, we don't have full pricing yet it should be a bit cheaper obviously than the R5 1400 though. Samsung announced last week that it successfully bought its newest fab in Payantech South Korea online for VNAND production. The multi-billion dollar fab was initially intended to serve as a DRAM manufacturing facility, but given the global flash shortage, Samsung has scaled the facility for NAND production, at least for the time being. Samsung's new facility will be the largest and most expensive fab in the world, especially once the facility reaches full production capacity. Also in the NAND and DRAM world, Micron had a bit of an issue last week. So a report by TrendForce indicated that Micron was suspending its operations on its Fab 2 facility because of a malfunction that allegedly, according to TrendForce, regarded a nitrogen leak, so a gas leak. And following that uh, claim of the nitrogen gas dispensing system malfunction, Micron came out and said that they had an event, uh, but they said that it was not a nitrogen leak. Either way, the temporary shutdown only serves to further hinder the DRAM and NAND supply right now and availability of things that stem from DRAM and NAND, which is really most everything at this point. So suspension will slow things down a bit. It looks like it'll be about 5.5% of a slowdown according to TrendForce in production, and that could be enough to exacerbate some of the memory shortage right now, but Apple's iPhone really puts the biggest dent in all of it because they're gonna take so much supply just to make the next iPhone 8. SK Hynix is beginning mass production of its recently announced 72 layer NAND. The new NAND offers 4 billion cells, improved circuit design, two times faster internal operation speeds, and 20% NAND to controller speed increases. SK Hynix plans to ramp up 3D NAND production at its M12 and M14 facilities, both in South Korea, 
which will allow them to begin shipping more 3D NAND than planar NAND by the end of the year. So this is part of the switchover and process that we've been talking about. Last week on the show, we talked about the new Toshiba QLC NAND, or quad-level cell, brand new, following TLC and VNAND, of course. And that was interesting because it looked like from what the online reports and speculation suggested, it was going to be a 100 to 150 PE cycles, pretty limited. 100 program erase cycles is not a lot, which means that you've got lower endurance than on other NAND and would follow the trend of, for example, TLC being much lower. But following the initial reports and announcements on Toshiba's new QLC NAND, the company came out and said that they're touting a 1000 program erase cycle instead of 100 to 150, quite a difference there. And that's enough to start rivaling TLC NAND. So if that's the case, it'll be potentially good for cost per gigabyte going forward. Uh, we're still unclear on this. We're still really not, we, we lack the clarity right now, lack any official testing. It's all just press releases at this point. So there's a lot more to learn about QLC going forward, but in the very least, that's a pretty big difference. And we should learn more at FMS next month, the flash memory summit that happens in August of every year. And now on to some of the miscellaneous news and product announcements. Aside from creating absurdly long product names, Thermaltake has a new high-end power supply to show off. This is the Thermaltake iRGB Plus 1250 Watt, and as the name implies, it offers RGB lighting inside of a fully modular 80 Plus Titanium 1250 Watt power supply. The lighting is controllable via Thermaltake software, which was just revamped for Computex 2017. The new PSU is equipped with Japanese capacitors, a 14 centimeter rain plus fan or 140 millimeters, and all heavy duty protections that you would expect on a titanium rated power supply. The unit though costs $400. EK Waterblocks also announced a new product last week and that's the M2 NVMe heatsink. These are interesting. So this is a big trend right now where people keep making M2 heatsinks, some of them better than others. But the thing is, SSDs are kind of tricky to cool. You really don't want to cool the NAND. The NAND being a bit warmer is technically better for endurance. How much is it noticed? Hard to say, but technically it's better for endurance to be warmer. You want the controller to be cool though. So if you were going to design like the perfect SSD heatsink for an M2 device, you'd probably just make something that you glue on for uh, sake of an easy explanation straight to the controller. That would be the best way to do it, but it doesn't look very good. So these companies are still making different heat sinking solutions. EK's is a black powder coated heat shield, which is $13. And then they've got a $15 one that's nickel plated as well. The company claims an 11 C reduction, presumably in uh, controller temperature primarily, and it's meant for use on a 2280 form factor M.2 drive. Interestingly, MSI has also just announced a new product line, and this time it's brand new for them. They've outed their first line of gaming monitors, dubbed the MSI Optics. It looks like there will be two models initially, the 27-inch Optics G27C and 24-inch Optics G24C. Both models are basically identical aside from the size, and both displays use Samsung TN panels with an 1800R curvature, so yes, they are curved following the trend, with a 1080p resolution, and 144 hertz refresh rate with AMD FreeSync. Pricing has not yet been announced, but this follows MSI's trend of attempting to expand into really everything. They're on a tremendous growth trend right now. The company over the past few years has done nothing but grow. So that's why you see them getting into things like mice, uh, expanding their laptops, getting into CPU coolers. Uh, some things they do much better than others, but the company is growing and, and that shows with the monitors. So the reason to bring that up it's interesting because right now ASUS is kind of the only other board vendor that's in basically everything. EVGA has been slowly expanding. They do cases, power supplies, laptops, and video cards now, with power supplies being one of their leading aspects of business. They have motherboards a bit on the side, I guess. Uh, but it'd be interesting to see if they get into monitors as well, because that seems like a major place to make a play for these video card companies. And then finally, Nvidia seems rather suddenly interested in MCM enabled products and technology in the future, meaning multi-die GPUs rather than a single monolithic die approach. It's a similar approach to what AMD is pushing with Threadripper and Epic. And in a white paper published by Nvidia, they show simulations demonstrating an alleged 45.5% improvement when comparing an MCM GPU design versus the latest and largest implementable monolithic die GPU. There are some other interesting figures in the white paper as well. We encourage you to take a look at it. 
There is a publication on research.nvidia.com if you're interested in that one. But this looks to be like what AMD certainly has interest in, and NVIDIA is now looking into it as well, where the companies are segmenting the monolithic die approach into multiple dies that are connected by some sort of interface, or infinity fabric, as AMD calls theirs. So that may be the future for avoiding the stagnation of Moore's Law, but there's a lot more to learn about it still. That's all for this week. As always, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly, or you can go to our store, store.gamersnexus.net, to grab a shirt like this one. Links in the description below. Subscribe for more, and I'll see you all next time.